Morning, everybody. Guys at the back can come closer if you want. <laughs> but you don't have to. Anyway, yeah, congratulations for getting up and here by 8.30. Bit of a brutal start to the day. Um, but it's a session we have this morning, which I think is interesting for quite a lot of people. Um, we're going to talk a bit about fire in general and a little bit about smart guidelines as well. But I mean, bear in mind that there's more to fire than just smart guidelines. In fact, there's also more to smart guidelines than just fire as well. Um, so yeah, I'll take a slightly more gen general um, take on that. I'm not gonna bore you for too long. I had about 10 slides last night and I cut them down. I've got three. <laughs> um, I just really want to kind of set the scene, explain a little bit about our, our, our kind of broader strategic positioning around fire. Um, and then I'll let you see some of the cool stuff that Johan and Stefano and them have been working on. Try not to get too geeky. Sometimes it gets a bit geeky, hard to avoid, but... All right. I'm assuming I don't have to tell people what is fire. The fact that people have made the effort to get up at half past eight in the morning and sit here, they probably know that already. What I'm not going to talk about is my very, very favorite concept of fire fetishism. Um, that's maybe something for a beer later. I just have this one, one slide here, which... It's not a beautiful slide, unfortunately. It's black text on the white background, and apparently I didn't use the template. Um, but I wanted to just try, if you're gonna leave in 10 minutes, and I know you might have to leave and go somewhere else. Uh, basically, what I try to put on here is a summary of where we, are, where we stand um, currently. And, we're going to go on a little bit of a journey through fire IGs and things like that. And maybe towards the end, we may come back and dwell a bit here again, see what questions and responses and people, people might have. So the first point seems like an obvious one, but somehow I find myself keep having to say it. The DHS2 has its own data model. Fire has a data model, DHS2 has a data model, and there are many systems out there, and they all have data models. There is a narrative I've seen, this kind of maturity model thing, where somehow all systems in the end are going to end up as fire repositories. Um, that doesn't seem to bear any real um, link with reality. Certainly not as we're seeing it in in the U.S. It's not how we're seeing it in. Uh, we were in Belgium recently, talking with our Digital Square friends. That's not how they're seeing it in Europe. There's just a lot of legacy systems out there, systems which have a data model which do their thing, and everybody really wants to use Fire, but we want to use Fire for data exchange for interoperability. Um, I know there are there are some products that have decided that. The best way for them to move forward is to remove their existing data model and and replace it with a with a with a happy fire underbelly. That's possible, I guess, in some cases. That would be extremely difficult for us to do, and it's probably not even very desirable for us to do, because hey, people are here using that data model; it works and it's doing quite a lot of good stuff. Okay. So that's my first point. Remember that. These are all the things you just have to remember. You can forget all the geeky stuff. The other thing, and this is a position which kind of evolved a little bit, but um, we're trying to become much more strident about it. Um, you know, I, I, I joke a little bit about the fire fetishists. Then people call us the fire Luddites, the laggards. 
From the DHS2 perspective, the way we're seeing the world at the moment, certainly the way we're seeing fire and the way that we're seeing tracker growing, we want to promote the idea that whenever you're going to do data exchange using, using tracker in particular, it's not necessarily a good match for aggregate, but that's a different discussion, I guess. Um, you sh probably should be using fire. Well, this is a big message for people managing implementations. Um, I say probably because there may be some cases where it doesn't make sense. But in most cases, if you're exchanging patient data, it's going to make sense. This is what you should be doing. And what we're going to see a bit later is some of the tooling that we have to try and make that a little bit easier to do. Um, we've got a, quite a few implementations I've been discussing with folk a bit this week. Um, oh, in, in, in Malawi with OpenMRS and Bangladesh. Um, we've talked to the folk from Pakistan yesterday. I all want to do tracker data exchange. We want to try to help them find a way to do that using FIRE. Okay, the other thing about FIRE, FIRE is like saying, like we all speak English, right? But if you've got a hairdresser and a car mechanic and an and a, and a agricultural vet, and they want to meaningfully have a conversation, they need to have more than English, right? They need to have something profiled to what they're trying to talk about. And in generally, for fire to be useful, it needs to be profiled. Um, you can use it without profiling. And often we see that. People just write arbitrary fire stuff. Um, and that can work, but it doesn't really get us very far in terms of interoperability. With interoperability, you want to have diverse systems able to interpret and talk to one another in the end, as we all know, it comes down to the metadata and the code lists and things like that. The other thing that is probably slowing down the uptake of, of fire a bit and certainly slowing down the uptake of things like the WHO smart guidelines is the dawning realization that, I mean, there's some skills required to do this. Um, but those skills actually need to be quite local because people want to localize their, their fire profiles to their particular environment. A Bangladeshi patient is not going to have the same codes and the like as a Malawian patient. So how do we localize skills and which skills? Um, come back to that in a bit. The other thing that we've realized, and this is, getting a bit geeky on the fire stuff, so if you're not sure what it is, I think Johan will explain a bit later. But there's something called a logical, pro a logical model when you're creating a fire profile. Um, and the logical model sometimes is viewed as a bit of an afterthought or a distraction because people want to go straight from the domain into defining fire resources. But the step of defining the logical model first is actually extremely important. It's important for, for interoperability, particularly if you have to deal with a non-fire-based system somewhere and the world is like that. Um, it's also important as a means to make sure that you don't end up with the, the tail wagging the dog, if you like, right? The, the, the technical people, all the fire engineers actually making all the decisions about what should have been decided by, by the domain experts. The other thing about a logical model, we were having this discussion earlier, is that you don't actually have to be really deeply trained in fire to be able to make a logical model. It's a relatively straightforward thing to do. Um, requires a little bit of learning, but not a lot. Not a lot. A day or two's training, somebody can make logical models. And one of our aims that we have as a community we do have access to quite a wide community, as we can see, for everyone who's here. We want to spread those skills throughout the network so that if you're sitting in, in Tuzo, sitting there in Dar es Salaam or whatever it is, and he's got a tracker program, he should be able to make a fire IG with a logical model on it. Um, those skills uh, are, are quite feasible to, to disperse. There are more high-level skills, if you like, that come after that about making the engineering mapping then between the logical model and actual fire resources. Where you get hold of those skills is still a puzzle. 
I guess we need to find fire engineers and fire consultants. I'm sure that they are they are sitting in a prime position in the market at the moment. Okay, the other question that comes up is around the WHO smart guidelines. Um, the smart guidelines been around for for a while. I don't know how many years it's been. Probably emerged over about five years now. I think they've been going through a bit of a learning process as well as everybody else. Um, one of the things that we really, really like is that their latest smart guidelines, and the latest one I saw was a measles immunization, for example, are actually very, very good from an interoperability perspective. We can, we can really use those. Some of the earlier ones were quite a little bit harder because I think the end goal was a little bit different. And one of the things that they skipped they didn't bother to elaborate the logical models because they saw it was just getting in the way. The newer ones are much better. We really like them. Um, and we have ways in which we can support them. Um, and you'll see some examples related to that uh, a little bit later. The way that we currently have been working with SMART guidelines, and people may have seen some of the work related to the to the the level two the dac that's the big spreadsheet stuff pre-fire if you like um the the health team rebecca and stefano and folk like that i mean they've worked off those things to define tracker metadata which matches the model that's a good thing in terms of semantic interoperability because it means that um, whether you're using fire or not fire at least we know everybody's using the same codes we know everybody's using the same codes. Um, there's always a way to make it work. I think, Stephanie, you're going to talk a little bit about the level two DAC work. Yeah. Okay, so I won't. The other thing that we're increasingly interested in doing, and we, particularly since we've seen this very nice new style of smart guideline that's coming out, um, is mapping as, as automated as possible. Um, mapping tracker metadata to the level three content. Um, we can do that now. Uh, it's generally it's not so hard to do. It's a little bit fiddly. The, the, we try to automate some steps along the way. Um, there's always going to be some point where you're going to need some engineering expertise to actually join some of the dots. But the other curious thing about SMART guidelines, I guess, is that part of our engagement with them over the over the last the last year or so, um, is we've kind of watched and listened and learned, and then we start to take some of the lessons we learned from what the SMART guidelines folk are doing, and we're using it in other ways and in other contexts. And I think Johan has quite a nice example of, of a kind of proof of concept from the animal health domain, which is obviously not coming from WHO, but following the same kind of methodology. So that's my summary slide. Sorry, it's a long summary. It's not very beautiful. Um, after... <laughs> you know, I used to have a rule when I, when I was teaching. It's a long time ago now. But if somebody's phone goes off in the middle of the class, they have to stand up and sing a song. So be warned. <laughs> The trouble is, one time we got a guy who really liked to sing, but we couldn't shut him up. Um, okay, just some of the ongoing firework. Um, unfortunately, Claude is not here. He might be online, but um, he couldn't be with us. I wanted to point you at this little piece of work because it's really, really interesting. Um, it's actually stuff that the, the HL7 Belgium group are now thinking, can they do something like this as well? Um, this is using our Apache Camel tool chain, which some folk might be familiar with. But we know if we, we don't have a happy fire server underneath DHIS2, right? We've got a DHIS2 underneath DHIS2. So what we need to do is to put a facade in front of it. Our facade essentially presents a, a fire API, and behind the fire API, transformations and the like are made and it actually talks to the DHS2 behind it. It's a well-known pattern, but doing it by hand is really, really something of a pain. And if your, if your IG is really big, 
This could take a while. So what Claude has done is discovered that inside SMART guidelines is a good example. Inside the SMART guideline IG, you'll find there's something called a capability statement. And there's also an open API spec implicit in that. So it's quite possible to take a SMART guideline and auto-generate the facade so that you end up with your, your REST API all fully defined and up and running, and you just have to do a little bit of mapping. So yeah, he's got steps here. The first one, generate the API. Um, he's got an example um, with a fairly simple IG, which is just using a questionnaire, questionnaire response, but it's a proof of concept. The same thing would work with any other kind of resource. If you get hold of the slides, there's a link there. Um, Claude has written quite a nice blog post about it where he goes through all the steps of if you wanted to do something like this, how to do it. Um, if you can't wait for the slide, just Google. Claude Facade blog, DHIS2, you'll find it. <laughs> I don't want to talk more about it other than say this, this, is, this is really a kind of missing piece for us. We really like this idea that in any context, if you can show me the IG, I can show you the facade. And on that, we can, we can build our DHIS2 support out. Um, the other thing, and this is what we're going to hear from, from Johan and Stefano a bit. Um, one of the things we discovered, kind of almost a little bit accidentally, that as we started looking at, well, here's my tracker program metadata stuff. I know I'm going to have to do fire with it, so I want to try, start trying to define some kind of profile or IG, which represents what's in there. Um, and you start making the logical model and all of those steps. But then we realize that you end up then with quite a nicely visually appealing and user-friendly full description of all the metadata in that tracker model. And it's much, much better than anything we're doing inside of DHIS2. I mean, what have you got in DHIS2? You could go to the, the management app and you can find all the pieces. Um, or you could dump a JSON file. But actually being able to express it and display it like this is actually a merit in itself. It's just very useful to be able to make what's inside the DHS2 program um, visible. One of the ways that I think Johan might be talking about in, in Rwanda, we're looking at Rwanda, they have, like everywhere else, some little bits of messy metadata, and they have like some... Programs have defined first name, last name, or whatever. But then when you look in the database, you see that two or three different tracker programs have each defined first name, last name, middle name. So you have these synonyms, if you like, of attributes. And they can be quite hard to find. But when you actually present them nicely so everybody can see, it's quite easy to identify them and um, start to go through the process of merging and clean, cleaning up. And the other thing that I talked about already at the start, we, we, we've been doing quite a lot of internal training already, I guess. Um, I don't know if we anyone from Digital Square here. Hey, Digital Square people. Hey. We have a, we, we have a debt of gratitude to our Digital Square friends. Um, uh, we spent a lot of time with, with Jose from Digital Square, who's been extremely encouraging and supportive and, and bring, brought an enormous amount of expertise to, to the work that we've done. And yeah, as I said earlier, our plan is to start rolling that training out, but trying to understand, first of all, what's the kind of division of labor? What set of skills do you need to do to have in order to be able to get to this stage? And let's target that. Um, and yeah, what I'd like to see, and I maybe this is just in my in my dreams, but maybe it's, as we get into 2025, is that the perception around fire and DHIS2 uh, is fundamentally changed. When I'd like to see with with, with our quite large network, uh, quite a lot of interest in in fire and using fire, that um, we'd like to be seen 
as the go-to people when it comes to doing integration with file. That's the, that's the aim for 2025. But that's all you have from me for the moment. Um, what I'll do is have a little bit of time at the end for discussion. Maybe we'll come back to, come back to there um, if people want to pick some of those things apart. But who's going first? Is it Stefano? You? Oh, Rebecca, welcome. Not that too long, that talk's too long already. It's going to be like a two minutes. Okay, I'm going to try not to take much of your time at all, but. <laughs> well, everyone got up here pretty early, so I'm impressed. So I'm going to hand over to uh, Stefano and really give some practical insights around how we're actually engaging with some of these smart guidelines. Um, but we've been looking at this over the course of years, and we've been collaborating with WHO on standards since 2017. And so sometimes we get the question of what are you doing in these packages and how does that relate to these different types of guidelines? And I think also over the years, WHO has started to evolve and, and mature their idea of, of what is included in these different levels of the SMART guidelines. So a little bit of background, uh, our WHO collaborating center since 2017, we were really looking at routine health data and how do you analyze that better? So how do you define these WHO core indicators? What comes out of the facilities routinely? What kind of data elements do you need reported? Uh, and really bringing the focus towards those dashboard analyses, data quality metrics, data use. So this was really heavily focused on the data use side and not really on clinical decision support, not in clinical management. So there have been 68 or so countries that have adopted uh, these types of, of analyses and standards, but there were a lot of things that we needed that also actually end up um, really quite represented in the um, level two digital adaptation kits for the DAC. So in the SMART guidelines in the DAC, you know, what is in this document, this level two? So taking the narrative guidelines, moving it one step forward um, towards how do you digitize some of these things. They do have the generic personas, the user scenarios. We find these incredibly useful for a tracker program, for example, but we typically, we can only design a standard package for maybe one scenario. So what do we do? We give you a user guide and we tell you, these are the business processes. This is the workflow for case-based surveillance that we're supporting here, but this is how you can change it. This is how you can adapt it. These are the types of users we designed for, but this is what you might need to think about. We still keep this kind of core metadata, but we really focus, as I said, more on dashboards, more on analytics. We are executable within DHIS2. If you want to be executable within FHIR, you would take more of an approach that Bob is saying, we look at FHIR as an interoperability layer, not something that we are trying to consume and execute within DHIS2 itself. I think decision support logic, again, we're really looking at routine data systems, but some of this we know we can build in. We can make it really useful in terms of being able to facilitate patient follow-up. So looking at those um, WHO recommended routine immunization schedules, being able to develop working lists to find children who have uh, missed their next dose, um, looking at HIV patients who um, are due for their next clinical visit. But what we are not trying to do is uh, the same thing as perhaps um, the Google or OpenSRP, which is to take the entire executable decision support guideline and execute that in tracker. That's not what we're trying to do. And the last thing we really try to focus on is um, looking at these uh, functional and non-functional requirements and sort of drawing a box and saying, this part we can support in DHIS2. This part is really good for the registry, but this is a part that we don't really go to. You know, We are not this type of tool or we are not this um, EMR. And so we hope that this is a little bit helpful in terms of framing the ways that we work, the way we work together. Um, but we also find that there's so many elements of these digital adaptation kits that are really useful for us to harmonize on. And Stefano is going to give a very practical example of how we've done that over the last year working with the HIV program. So thank you.
So thank you very much, Rebecca, for the uh, for the background. And uh, yeah, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the collaboration that we have been uh, working with uh, um, with uh, WHO <clears throat> about the HIV toolkit that we've been developed on the last uh, during the last year. So as you can see, here is just a snapshot about um, how many countries have taken the toolkit about HIV. So only the dashboard indicators part as well, or as well uh, uh, the tracker. Something that uh, is increasing step by step as, as well, because uh, digitalization and collection of individual data is something that normally is extremely painful on uh, to be done in the field. And uh, this slide is just to provide a kind of an example on how painful can be uh, the management of uh, HIV related data in uh, an HIV program. So uh, different sources uh, that can be, every, can be from DHS2, from other software, um, data coming from the MOH, from other organization, how this data can be combined at which level, individual de uh, individual level or more uh, for aggregated analysis. So this is a little bit of the reason why when we are producing this type of uh, toolkits, a little bit as well suggest our very strong suggestion is to try to stick to international standards as much as possible. And uh, the toolkit has been based on the, in reality, that is not correct, is the, the last uh, HIV guidelines that were released uh, in July 2023. And as well, we have been working uh, and testing the the, um, the second version of the digital adaptation uh, um, kit from the, from the HIV. Uh, there are the three main components of the toolkit are the HMIS, uh, the, uh, so HIV HMIS modules that are more aggregate data, uh, HIV prevention, HIV case surveillance uh, tracker model. And uh, as you well know, all the different aspects that are, are supported uh, on uh, with DHS2. So data collection, data analysis, uh, and part of the of the toolkit is as well, uh, some documentation like implementation guidance and system design guides. And uh, well, I will not go really because I think we are very, uh, we are very, really very aware about the smart guidelines, different level, et cetera, et cetera. But, here I'm just uh, bringing the example of HIV. So it was one of the first toolkits that we have been working, not only with the level one, because all the other toolkits we have been developed, of course, we have been working with the level one, the, the classical narrative guidelines, but as well, the second layer, the level two of uh, with the digital adaptation kits. And, uh, okay. So what we have been done in collaboration with uh, with WHO was really trying to uh, uh, we really use the digital adaptation kit, especially the annexes, the uh, data dictionary and the indicator dictionary. We find extremely useful at the moment of creating uh, and uh, shaping our uh, HIV toolkit. So here is just an example how we have been compliance, okay, with uh, with the um, with the DAC. So for example, with the HIV prevention. Uh, um, tracker model, 80% of the data may, the, of the DHS2 metadata and be mapped with the DAC. And when I say mapped, is that all the metadata has the correspondent uh, code in the, um, that is present in the in the DAC. And for HIVK surveillance, the, uh, for the data model as well, the 92%. So normally the things that have not been mapped are metadata that are more related with the data flow. Uh, for example, the, the previous version 2.40 were not supporting multi-option, so kind of repetition of some of the elements. Of course, all the indicators with all the different disaggregation has been uh, are possible to be calculated with the DHS2 uh, with the DHS2 data model, the, the HIV toolkits. And here are just some of the some of the example of what is present uh, on the on the toolkit about, related with the visualization and the anal and the analytics. And the thing that I would like to uh, to show when I was talking about uh, the mapping between the DHS2 metadata and the digital adaptation kit is really mapping metadata by metadata. So the DHS2 metadata with a relative. Uh, uh, DAC uh, uh, with a related DAC code, not only the DAC code, but as well all the other uh, international standards that are related uh, with it. So, for example, ICD 11s, NOMED, LOINIC, etc. And uh, something that was extremely useful, as was saying uh, at the beginning, is uh, how we use the indicator, um, the indicator dictionary that is part of one of the annexes of the digital adaptation kit. Uh, to uh, create uh, program indicators in DHS2. I think program indicators normally is extremely painful, but we find that this, um, here I just report an example, but we really find that the way how 
the calculation value indicator is explained in the DAC, extremely useful to inform on the DHS2 side. So for example, here, uh, HIV in pepper, in pepper recipients or num uh, number of people testing positive for HIV three months after receiving PEPs. You know, you already see that the, the indicator need to be filtered with the different uh, um, for different aspect. The text that you are seeing here, count of clients with indication prescribed with equal PEP, this is coming from the, from the DAC. So we really take this uh, and going point by point. So count of clients, okay. This is a program indicator of type of type event with aggregation type count. Medication prescribed. This data element that is going to be uh, that is going to be filtered. Uh, and date medication prescribed, the initiation date. So you see how to be able to allow the calculation of this indicator, we inform and we create a data model based on uh, on that. And um, the HIV test. Uh, uh, the HIV test date, uh, less than three months. Uh, so here is just the formula that is present uh, in the program indicators with a HIV test result uh, positive. Okay, so we really use the definition of the indicator that is present in the DAC to inform uh, on, the, on the data model. It can seem something extremely obvious, but it's not at all because uh, the, the definition of indicators, uh, you can have uh, a lot of different interpretation, but having explained it, very in a very systematic way on the DAC can really help uh, on the on the adaptation uh, on the uh, DHS2 sites. And uh, as we were saying, Rebecca, before, um, I mean, we know that through program rules, et cetera, et cetera, in the DHS2, we can support some of the business logic. Uh, the objective of DHS2 is not really to be an EMRs, but uh, here, just an example of how some of the of the uh, of the business logic that are present uh, in the DAC can be supported and should be supported in HIV. Normally, for the toolkits, we really try to keep it as simple as possible because when a country then needs to uh, or decide to uptake this toolkit, uh, we will know that it is much easier adding in the HS2 rather than uh, st uh, start mapping and try to see uh, all the program rules, data elements, etc. We they, we should eliminate it for all the problem of dependencies. And uh, that's all here, just some of the links uh, related with the, uh, with all, where you can find all the different uh, resources. It's been uh, a very great collaboration with the WHO for the HIV toolkit, I mean, it's for everything, but uh, specifically for the smart guidelines and the DAC, the, sec the, the second edition was, uh, was extremely useful. And we really see how this can inform and how this very powerful tool uh, um, to inform for the different uh, metadata models presenting DHS2. So that's all, Bob. Over to you. As you prefer. As you prefer, if you want to wait for the end. There is already a question. But... Oh, I'm just worried that I'm going to be letting the down loose. How are we on time? So we would take this one. Yeah, let's take one or two questions. Okay. Okay, okay, okay. So don't run away. If there are any burning questions for Stefano, we'll take two and then move on to Johan. Thank you. Yeah, Joseph here. Burning question indeed. So uh, at the moment, um, for the for the DAC data dictionary, um, have we tried to also link up with the terminology service or link with the other international data dictionaries like CO and OCL and make them available? Because I think I think in terms of the interoperability, it's really crucial. Because in the hospital facility setting, we may use the EMR system or hospital information system. But then we generate the patient or client health records. And then when it goes to the community, when we are going to start performing tracking or vice versa, referral patient or clients from community to facility, we need the data to be able to flow. And then to link with the, I, I, I don't know, is there any efforts right now or progress? Because uh, linking with the, with, a, with, with some uh, international standard data dictionary would be very helpful. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for this. Um, right with the HIV, so the mapping that we've done has been with the DAC, 
And within the DAC as well, each one of the metadata has been mapped with other international standards. So it's automatically been done for, uh, for this reason, for the HIV, yeah. And yeah. On, on, on the OCLs, sorry. So generic one, no, but just because we are, we just started this exercise now with the, so it was the first toolkit that we uh, we decided to work greatly with the second, uh, with the DAC. <clears throat> and on the OCL projects, I mean, we've talked a lot with them. Um, we have fairly regular check-ins with them. With them. Um, I think what we don't want to do is to kind of bake that in as a dependency somehow. That if you're gonna if you're gonna deploy a DHIS two with this guideline, you have to have OCL. But if OCL is there, then certainly we'd like to use it. Yeah. Oh. The data dictionary. Yeah. yeah. So I think you know as these are emerging, some with the digital adaptation kits, well. What we are finding, depending on the use case, so for example, in case surveillance, a lot of these data elements in the data dictionary, they don't really map to things like ICD-11 because they're not necessarily always giving you clinical conditions. Um, so we have an example, I think it was actually the um, ANC registry that we actually did quite a bit more with actually linking with the different terminologies that were identified in the DAC. In that design, we actually represented those through um, custom attributes in DHIS2. So you kind of have that additional tag that says, you know, this is what this is. The ICD-11 code is this. I think we haven't really gotten to a point where this has actually been really proven useful in the field. Um, I do think looking at Open Concept Lab and other things like that in terms of just metadata management and concepts and terminology, but I will also say from a metadata side, looking at all of our metadata and um, not always having it uh, properly coded. And also a lot of times because it's not necessarily appropriate to be coded. So we did this for, I think, um, COVID case surveillance. Not all of the concepts are necessarily something that would directly code, uh, depending on what you're looking at, right? Public health use cases are not the same as clinical records in many, in many scenarios. Um, but where was I going with that? Not that it wasn't useful, but it is hard to, um, it's like you really, ah, the semantic standards is what I was going. So I think that's also something that we're really looking to, to some of these um, fire tools for interoperability. I think what becomes really important is kind of looking at some of those expressions of the semantic standards and really understanding what is the same on both sides. So I think once we get through some of the things that Johan shows you, I think from our side, we believe if, if DHI is too, can be interacting properly with um, uh, FHIR implementation guide, that should be the way that we feel compliant with a set of semantic standards, if that makes sense. So I think I'll just leave it there. Patrick, can you, can you, can you hold, hold your breath? <laughs> oh, yeah. We only have 20 minutes. <laughs> Hold it, you're, 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 you're first in the queue for the next opening of questions. Yeah, I can do So on this one, I will just uh, do a little bit of introduction because uh, it was a work that we have done in collaboration with uh, Joanne and, uh, and Bob, so, for sure, as you will well know, uh, we have published the Animal Health Surveillance uh, Toolkit last week. Uh, it was a um, collaboration effort uh, together with the CDC, FAO, and uh, the WOA agency. And um, we were hosted, uh, uh, we were part of an interoperability workshop in Rome, uh, more or less one month ago, to try to understand a little bit how international standards, uh, which approach they should take from animal side as well. So one of the um, one of the key aspects of uh, the toolkit that uh, has been based uh, on the AIMPRESI system, uh, that is the system used by FAO for the animal health surveillance system, early warning. 
and uh, taking this uh, an opportunity then uh, we did a little bit uh, of uh, semantic mapping uh, on ontology try to see how this um, the toolkit that have been created can be mapped uh, not only with the empress but as well with the other international standards are present like the wahis that is the tool used by waho that uh, is the mandatory uh, information system used for the countries to report animal health surveillance uh, system so we take the opportunities to create uh, uh, to create was an exercise so to create uh, based on the dhs2 data model a fire implementation uh, guide so i will leave the floor to johan yeah thank that. you stefano so yeah as stefano mentioned it was just just done as an exercise to see uh, if we were able to create an implementation guide purely based on the dhs2 uh, data model in the context of animal health so before I dive into the example, I was thinking that we can just take a step back and just firstly explain uh, what a logical model actually is. So uh, in our case, the logical model represents the data structures within DHS2. Um, and we try to represent the metadata in an independent way of any uh, physical limitations, uh, like which fire release you are on or profile version you are using within your fire context. And the use of fire logical models allows metadata to be uh, structured, computable, and interoperable uh, for the purposes of uh, governance and checking. So you can um, you can take all of your stakeholders and your clinicians and uh, work with them iteratively to create um, the, the logical models. So that's the idea. So creating the logical models entails capturing the attributes and data elements in the DHS2 program uh, with their description and terminology, such as option sets and the data values and uh, cardinality constraints. So if the data field in a program stage is mandatory or not. Uh, and you can represent all of these things in the logical model. And logical models can relate to or linked to other logical models through uh, extensions uh, or constrained parent models. For example, a patient extending a, a person and logical models can also uh, contain other models as a data type. Uh, for example, patient and pr practitioner containing uh, a name data structure. And logical models can also refer to other models. For example, a, a request referencing a product. So uh, I was thinking that we can perhaps show it it's live uh, as well if we get time after this uh, presentation. So, uh, yeah, so this uh, implementation guide is then an example of uh, resource mapping with fire standard resources. So we just have uh, one example in addition to the, uh, we have, one example, in addition to the logical models, which is uh, the mapping from the logical model to uh, questionnaire resource within FHIR. Um, but the main bulk of this implementation guide uh, are the logical models. And yeah, as I mentioned, we also have the example of a FHIR questionnaire that we used. So here you can actually see the structure of the logical model. And as you can see, it's a very nice and intuitive tree structure where we have just uh, mapped the program stage within DHS2. Uh, so you can see that the different sections within the program stage are mapped to these backbone elements, which uh, creates uh, branches throughout the tree. So we have the general information, um, so you can see the first column is just uh, the name of the data elements uh, in camel case. And we have the cardinality 
as well. So the cardinality represents if it is mandatory or not. So you see that all of the elements here are mostly zero to one, which means that uh, it can be omitted, but if it is included, it will only be uh, one instance of the data element. And you can see uh, towards the end there that we have uh, animal surveillance logical model and the laboratory logical model, um, which can be zero to many, meaning that you can have uh, a lot of animal surveillance uh, logical models within this logical model. Um, and you can also see the descriptions and constraints on your data models as well. And all of this is fetched from DHS2 metadata. And I think we can also see how this looks like in the MPSI system. So as you can see, the uh, attributes has been harmonized. So it matches both the MPSI system and DHS2. So just as an example, we took these uh, logical models that were defined and uh, mapped them over to a file resource. In this case, it was a questionnaire um, and it was just a simple example. As you can see, it is almost a one-to-one -one mapping from the logical model and to the questionnaire uh, resource. Uh, you can see we have the different data types with uh, choices being linked to value set. And these value sets represent the different option sets within the DHS2 program. And what we have found out and what we are uh, still working on now is how we can automate a lot of this work because the option sets in DHS2 can be easily map to code systems and value set sets within um, fire. So we have done some scripting to help us auto generate this, but we are still looking into making it more uh, usable and user friendly. And also with this questionnaire example, you can uh, get this nice uh, form you as well. So you can see that we have added the different uh, code systems for animal species. So you can just go in and uh, select one. And uh, as I mentioned, these are all gotten from DHS2. So yeah, that was all from me. Thank you. Thank you. And you're saying when you came on, we only had 20 minutes. I just remember this session goes on for 10 o'clock. <laughs> so we have lots of time for discussion. We do a lot of PowerPoints. Yeah. Don't want to worry you. No. Hello, hello. Okay, so you heard a little bit about what we've been up to and what our thinking is around around the way that fire is going to be useful for DHIS2 and its users. Um, some of it's more complicated than others, but um, it's kind of the nature of it. We have a good bit of time for questions and discussions. So um, I know Tuzo and Patrick were both eager to go just before Johan came on. So we'll, we'll go there and then let's take it from there. Rudolf, I see you are there as well. <laughs> yeah, look, Tuzo and Patrick, then Rodolfo at the moment. And the digital squares. 
Okay. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your presentation. Uh, it has shed the some light on the uh, fire and the smart guideline. One thing maybe I'm failing to distinguish and uh, that I'd like you to help me. Uh, when you are talking about uh, dark, uh, how is it related with the smart guideline layers? That's the one that I think it's still confusing me. Yeah. You want to talk about DAC, Rebecca? Yeah, that might be more of a WHO question, but if they have um... Yeah, you have that picture with the layers. Yeah. DAC is an old tool. And the smart diagram is IG, which is a, a fire of the uh, IG. It's, it's a way to uh, describe it. it can be a PDF, it can be uh, an IG. So at least from our understanding, so the level one narrative guidelines, you know, that's the book. That's the 2022 HIV strategic information guidelines. That's about three to 400 pages and tells you what you should be monitoring with HIV. The digital adaptation kit that we worked with was actually, it was uh, largely, it was a set of Excel sheets. There are other components to this. The components that we used were the data dictionary that is represented in an Excel sheet and it's nice and well, um, has all the columns for all of the different ways it can be mapped um, and to different vocabularies. Uh, we do understand from working with that team that that's actually very resource intensive and it's also very a specialized skill. You know, you need to really work with people who are very, um, fluent in those different types of vocabularies. Um, and then the, uh, for example, they have reference indicator sheets in that, in that level two. So the level two digital adaptation kit, there's, that's not fire yet, right? That's kind of moving from paper then sort of towards what they call human readable. And it really is because they're mostly Excel sheets, they're business process maps, um, things that kind of help you to start realizing how would you take this on the pathway? To digitalization, but I think this machine readable, that's when you are starting to get into uh, the world of fire. So in theory, the way I understand it, at least and WHO colleagues and others could um, probably say this uh, better. But um, for example, you could have, I think, a fire logical model and an implementation guide that represents what is in that digital adaptation kit. And then that's being represented in fire. However, there's kind of two sides of this as well. There's also that component that we as DHIS2, we don't really work with very much because we are not an EMR. And so there are some of these clinical decision support algorithms that mm -hmm. there are, um, what is it, the Google stack? I forget what it's called, the Google Android stack. Open health stack. Open health stack. And others are kind of, you know, designed to execute those types of clinical decision support algorithms, but those are not something that we are we are addressing, at least here in, in the examples we've shown. So I don't know if that helps a little bit with some of the distinguishes. Mostly a spreadsheet. Patrick, you had something that you was was burning. Just thank you, Excel. Um, so I have two, two questions. The first is uh, on the way you map the data. You display uh, it was uh, you, I think. You display uh, like even uh, like a, a test date and uh, and test result. I was wondering with two different data elements. I assume how you can link them and how you can uh, be, because I was surprised. I was expecting to have uh, the date as an event date because you if you have a tracker, you have an event, and then I. I think it's confusing to have this test that. So uh, maybe I'm missing something. So can you uh, please explain? Oh, look at me. <laughs> so the, for for this example of the data, the way how we structure the tracker, uh, the event date was a visit date, because the 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 uh, yeah the way how we structure is very was very flat. So we really try to keep it as simple as possible to for a country that they decide to uptake it to. To be the the uh, as easy as possible, so that's why we prefer to use uh, the visit date as an even date, and then to add several data elements for the specific data of uh, for the, the ones that, for example, you uh, you uh, you ask for. So, but I don't know if I answer your question.
if I want to do some dashboard about testing and I want to do, uh, let's say, uh, the, the result uh, uh, over time, mm -hmm. uh, then how uh, I will do that? Because uh, then it's it's within the tracker, I will have to to uh, report on the date, on the test date with the result uh, in the result uh, uh, that I meant. Is, uh, you have to use the custom uh, uh, period boundaries in the program indicators. So instead of using uh, event date or enrollment date, uh, use your custom. So most of the program indicators that are part of the toolkits use a custom period boundaries. So in this way, you can uh, say, for example, only for a testing, uh, uh, testing uh, when the data was uh, when the test was done, when the result was received. There are different dates, and for the program indicates you are going to create, you have to use the custom period boundaries. Yeah. Okay, we we we're descending into into detail. <laughs> <laughs> Rodolfo, you had something to contribute. So so I I just want to confirm that what I think. Where you're going is is really where you're trying to go is uh, when when I saw that mapping between fire, um, the the HIS uh, model, it looks to me like and, and you're talking that you're developing scripts that are going to automate. Well, you have some scripts already that are automating the creation of some of it. Uh, some of that. What is that you're going? Is it that you're going to go to the export app? Um, there is a button of generate IG from my program. You select a program and exports an IG. And then you go to the import section and you select an IG, imports the IG and converts that into a tracker program. Is that on the vision? Is that really feasible? Because I don't even know if it's feasible. Uh, especially when you, I mean, there are so many things that will be missing because what you were saying, Rebecca, it's also like, you're not gonna have a level three output because there are many things that are impossible to translate, but maybe you get to 2.5. Mm. Yes. <laughs> Is uh because at least you know getting the the form for data capture, uh we even with some even with some of the logic uh uh may be feasible in and out. Is that on the vision that at least on the metadata you can generate IGs, import IGs and if you already have the IG, that means for the data, you will be able to, you, you already have then the mapping between your data and the outputs. So you can generate par compatible outputs, questionnaire responses, basically. Rodolfo, there's a, there's a lot in that. Right? <laughs> um, I, it's often asked, you know, are we gonna just, build all this functionality into DHS to core, or is it done outside using using middleware and, and like that? Currently, none of it is in core. And I think there's lots of good reasons for that. And the core data model is just not just designed only for use with fire. So I've got other things. Um, all of the tooling around around facades and IG generation and things like that um, is being done in middleware. And we're trying to standardize on this Apache Camel based tool chain. Um, um, at some stage, somebody's going to write an app. Um, once all those back end things actually work um, cleanly. Um, there's there's need for all kind of apps that need to be written, not even just an app. I mean, one thing that I think is is really quite critical, and it's you know you can generate those facades automatically when you look at Claude's blog, but the real tricky thing then is you then have to do the mapping, right? What what part of DHS two is going to map to what part of this fire resource? That is kind of crying out for some kind of mapping app. Somebody needs to write. Um, exporting an IG directly off a tracker program. Um, again, doing that through user interface makes sense, but I don't know if Austin is here. Hi, Austin is here. Yeah. But think of this from an extensibility perspective. Um, I could see that functionality existing within an app, but it would probably make use of an additional service outside of DHS2 core. Hopefully, Austin, I'm, I'm, I'm on your right wavelength. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, I, I think the apps will come. Um, at the moment, the, we're trying to solve the really tricky problems of, of um, first of all, how do you do mapping? Um, what kind of things can you map to and what kind of things can't you map to? And if you have a good mapping, can you generate a, a facade so that people can actually use it? But we look forward to app suggestions, app competition next year. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. So for me, it's really not a question. I just want to, to share experience from what Digital Square has been doing. And I really appreciate like the efforts done by the UIO his team. And I would say the his team in general, if I look of where we came from in terms of like fire standard. Anyway, I'm from Digital Square. So we advocate for global goods to adopt the use of standards and fire so it's it's one of them and in the past two months we had a training in april in zambia a fire training that was more focused on mobile and we we're trying to learn from what the open srp team has done with their open srp application and last week before i came here we had a fire training in, in tanzania where we had different stakeholders that work with the ministry of health to see how first to learn and see what are like the immediate use cases with fire. And in all these trainings, what came up is that there is an immediate use of facade as Bob has said, because we already have these applications running and it's not very easy to go back and rewrite the entire data model. And it's not something we are recommending, but maybe that is something to think of for new applications that are being developed now. So the mapping stuff that was explained, because that is where we take the current data model, the existing data model, if it is an EMR or any other community health, health toolkit, for example, application, that is how we map the data into a fire model and then make use of the facade for other applications to get data in a fire standard and so we minimize the point to point integrations that we have been we have been dealing with and then the other one was on the use of a clinical quality language so if we have this data existing in a fire format then it's easy not really very easy but it's easy to write clinical quality language expressions that would be calculating indicators and calculating aggregate data, for example, from EMRs that can be directly imported into, into DHS2 applications. And I would say the questions that have been asked here is same questions that we have faced in this training. So we, we, we were kind of like doing a pilot training. As Bob said, there is not enough material that would take someone from point A to point B. What has been happening, it's fragment i would say like fragmented concepts so you learn about profiling you learn about mapping you learn about secure but there has not been one training which takes you into a place where you learn how all the different pieces fit together and how you can make use of that and that is why there has been that slow adoption adoption of the standard so we we are still working to improve on on, on that training and I don't know where we'll be next year. Maybe we will have a session to like share more about what we'll have find out. And if I may like contribute to the question of the smart guidelines, there was a question of where the imp implementation guide really fits in the smart guide guideline approach of the WHO. So like she explained, sorry, I didn't get the name, but the narrative is like the general guideline that already exists and where we go to level two is more like software requirements where we document what the business processes are from those guidelines and what are the workflows and what the data dictionaries we can get out of those and also document all those uh, expressions for calculating indicators. 
but they are still in like Excel sheets and Word documents. So what countries would be doing, they would start say from level two, because the operational is where we always have been. Now level two is we are moving towards a digital agnostic approach. So countries would be taking the operational, the level two documents and customizing those based on their country implementations. And when we go to level three is the, ma the machine reader, but this is where we have the implementation guide. So an implementation guide is still like a requirements document, but something that is computable because this is where in fire language, we use, we use the fish language, the shortened expression of fire to document whatever is in level two, the, the data dictionaries, which will now be the code systems and define what the value sets we're going to be using. And then out of that generate a publishable guideline that we can see as it was shared. And we can also still have the code that we can always go back and edit if there are any edits. The level, the level four is where we now go into the real applications. It's now translating the data model and all the, the business processes that were described in, in the level two writing those into applications. So the level four is the repo applications. This would be DHS2, this would be OpenSRP, this would be Comcare or whatever other application. For the dynamic part is now in this context will be like the secure stuff where you go into the applications and work with the data to get the analytic, get the, to calculate the indicators, to calculate whatever aggregate data and anything that is done on top of the application. But all of this documentation still goes back into the implementation guide where it is like a living documentation. I would say mainly for developers because it is written in, in a more machine readable format, but it is still publishable. So anyone who has interest can be able to read it. So this is in a nutshell. I just wanted to contribute to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm very pleased to hear that Digital Square have got and continue to have what the fire training plans. Um, and as I'm listening to you talk there, I, I almost have the opposite view, I think, mind you, about the training. I think what you were saying is that, if I got you right, there's been trainings on this aspect and trainings on that aspect, but we need to do trainings which cover everything. I think that's been part of the problem with fire adoption, not not understanding the division of labor properly. But how much do I need to know in order to do something? And then train on that rather than to take people who are who, whose primary responsibility is configuring um, help domain information or metadata in a tracker program and teaching them about developing where well, they're not developers. So I think we need to really try to try to separate a little bit more, understand a little bit more what skills are required for which people to do what. Not try and put everybody into developer workshops because it just turns them off. <laughs> um, and it's not required in for most people anyway. Um, so but yeah I'm looking forward to to working more with Digital Square about, about doing trainings and hopefully getting them to support some of our trainings. Um, the CQL stuff is interesting. Right? I spent the last few years saying that we, we, we can never just, we just can't do CQL. Because CQL, clinical query language, it's like, it's just like a better version of our program indicator expressions. Right? Um, um, Patrick is nodding his head in a funny way. Um, now, the thing about clinical query language, um, the way that it's most commonly used is there's an underlying assumption that you're running queries on a fire data store. And that being the case, it doesn't make sense to us because we don't have an underlying fire data store. The other thing that we'd be concerned about, you know, we're not running a, a little app for a community health worker on a mobile phone who's maybe got 100 patients, right? We've got to run these things on 20 million tracked entities. So always everything else, 
take second place to how well can you get this thing to perform? Um, so yeah, Isa said CQL is, is, is bridge too far. We'll never get there. I'm having second thoughts. I think there are actually some interesting things that we can do with CQL. Um, and in some ways, um, there may be things that would actually make our existing program indicator expression language a little bit more expressive. But that's down the line. Um, official line at the moment is we, we can't do CQL. We'll do it. If you think of, of the fire IGs, like in computer science 201 of, of um, data structures and algorithms, right? We don't do the algorithms. Um, but if you've got a Google Open Health Stack phone or a, or, a, or a open SRP phone out there in the field doing whatever it does, when it sends its fire payload back home, we'll be able to read it. And that's the interoperability um, target that we're aiming at. Right. Uh, I'll give it to you. So I think the, I mean, I had discussion also uh, um, with the WHO team regarding that. And I think in the DAG, the goal is to to have SQL that is not uh, including the data acquisition part. So in, in SQL, you, you can if, uh, like search for observation or whatever resource you want. And, but there is a, like, a, you can use it in an overall level saying like this equals that uh, or different contains with a basic expression language. And uh, um, according to uh, those discussions, the goal in the DAC will be to stay on that level, and, and which will match more or less with that element. And, and then like the real SQL will be in, in libraries or uh, uh, outside the DAC. So just, just so like that, this level could be somehow uh, uh, compatible with DHS2 because it's about concept. Uh, but really, uh, the, the precise SQL uh, will be elsewhere because it's it's way too complex uh, for for many people. It's a very very specific language. If you go to that acquisition and not just to logic, pure logic. Yeah, I, mean, I, I think there's a lot of challenges. CQL official position at the moment, anyway, is it's we're, we're putting it out of scope of what we're trying to support. Um, it does raise interesting questions around compliance because there's a, there's a lot of, of, of um, things you hear, we even see written in RFPs. About fire compliance, uh, being compliant with the smart guideline. That discussion around compliance hasn't really matured properly yet. It's really at this stage not very clear. What does it mean to be compliant? Who measures it? With what? Um, can you be compliant with this bit and not with that bit? Um, I think it's it's a discussion that is actually, I mean, we are, we are part of the discussions that are happening within those smart guideline technical meetings. There's a, there's a, a work group just being formed within IHE, which specifically focused around around how can we measure compliance. I'm not sure how that work group is going. I haven't joined many, many of the meetings. But that's something that, that we're going to be very, very wary of. When people start using the language of compliance, then it's got to be extremely well to know what we mean. Um, if you're saying I'm compliant or not compliant, how do we measure that? Um, at the moment, there's not sufficient guidance or uh, um, compliance um, statements, if you like, um, within the, the smart guidelines work that we've seen. Some of it can be within the, I mean, if you look at our perspective, we want to support the content, but we're not so interested in the CQL stuff, for example. There's two ways to address that. I see the way that that is being addressed in some of the US clinical practice guidelines, IG, is they have them in two completely separate IGs. That kind of makes a lot of sense. You have a content IG. Now that just describes content, not all the data structures. And then you have an algorithms IG, which um, refers to the content IG. Um, 
And then you have a way of saying, all right, we're compliant with that one, we're not compliant with that. Um, I wish that it, they had done it like that from the start. I hope they still might. That's certainly the way that I've seen the, the clinical practice guideline work going in the US and what they've done. They have the US base score patients or whatever it's called. Um, and then they'll make their, their CQL based IG simply refer to that content stuff. I think that that would open up smart guidelines for for much 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 broader adoption for one thing we could we'd see many 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 more systems able to actually conform to those content steps who can't currently conform to the to the algorithmic stuff yeah. uh, not sure if that's I, I think i went way off the question. yeah Hi. Really great to see all this work, guys. Um, a couple of questions. Um, one is around some of the some of the resources in DHIS two that might be a little bit more native, uh, easy to 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 represent and fire natively, and that's the org unit hierarchy, and also aggregate data elements and indicators using measure using the measure resource. I was wondering if you guys have been doing any thinking about that. So, you know, modeling the org unit hierarchy in FHIR, um, using measure, maybe instead of ADX. Um, and then the other thing is around the, the middleware. Um, have you given any thought how you might package that so that it could be um, used by countries? Good question. Um... There are parts of DHIS2, as you say, which have got, which are, are kind of fixed. You think of it as the cold spots and hot spots, right? There are cold, cold parts of DHIS2, which don't vary whether you're making this program or that program or another program. And the kind of things typically that those would consist of things like all units, all, all, all interoperability profiles are going to include an all unit something. It's going to be translated into, into a fire location and organization mix. We don't really. Um, so, yeah, we'll we actually standardize that mapping now. Um, from GitHub. But when we did that right at the start, what we were looking at it very early on was that look at a if you really wanted to do basic, basic, basic entry level fire, that would work with anything that's in DHIS2 without even having to be complicated mapping. All you needed to do was to have a fixed, fixed way of representing all units, fixed way of representing option sets and value sets, and just do the rest of question um, You can do anything like that. Um, it's it has limitations, I know. It's not a way that you would necessarily do. Um, uh, uh, um, tracker integrations where you wanted to maintain more semantic richness in it. I used up the battery. So yeah, the cold spots and hot spots, the things that the things that are, are standard and generic, I think we've pretty much addressed. Ranga, I see, just came in at the back. I mean, one thing that Ranga started doing was, and I think this actually be really useful, I'm really trying to drag it out of him so that we can publish it, is a kind of a glossary. A glossary is useful to be able to say, well, you know what, in DHS2, we call a tracked entity as a fire resource that will probably be a patient. DHIS2, you have an event. Um, if Patrick has his way, that'll be an event resource in fire. <laughs> but this is kind of glossary of terms to help people who are coming from one side or coming from the other side to, to make sense out of the words. Um, I don't know. There, there was a second part other than the org units, but I can't remember what it was. Yeah. Ah, the aggregate. Aggregate and packaging. 
I don't want to have a big fight now about aggregates, um, but I'm tempted. Because <laughs> fire is really not very good at aggregates. Um, and that's why, that's why, you know, a good few years back now, 2015, we went to IHE and we worked through that technical committee to come up with an internationally balanced, balloted standards for aggregate data exchange, which some of you here have used. Um, and the point about that was that um, it's just actually much more efficient for transmitting particularly large amounts of aggregate data. I think from the fire perspective, if you want to transmit aggregate data using fire, again, you've got two choices, I guess. You're either going to use a questionnaire. Um, questionnaire mapping to an aggregate data set is not a bad approach. I would actually do that over over doing uh, MADX. MADX and measure report and measure. I don't know. I don't think they're very mature resources. They, they, have, they have a lot of... Um, Underlying assumptions around the CQL stuff, which we know we find difficult anyway, but doesn't necessarily has to be in CQL, but that's the focus of how they mostly go. Um, but it's a huge, huge amount of overhead to transmit a simple data value. You've got a lot of gobbledygook that you have to bring around with it. And I don't like it much. I mean, if we were in a situation where someone said, look, we have to... We have to get aggregate data out of this EMR system, and that system is going to give it to us using using um, a measure or measure report. Then we'd map it. But if someone said, "I've got an EMR system, I want to produce a, a, a aggregate data set report," what should I do? I wouldn't tell them to use measure. I would probably tell them to use ADX. It's the easiest thing to generate off, a, off an EMR. Um, and it's just much more efficient. But I, I know that, that that's my view. There are other other views out there, and I, I think the the aggregate thing. And it's, this starts to get into what I'm calling fire fetishism, right? Which is not a weird psychosexual oddness. It's a, people kind of think that they have fire that they need to be able to use it for everything, and it's just going to naturally fit. But in this case, I don't think it's very good fit. Measure and measure report is like a it's like a clinician's perspective on what an indicator is rather than public health perspective on what indicators are for. Okay. There, I, now have I upset everyone? <laughs> <laughs> okay. And there was the there was something else you were asking, was that okay. yeah. Yeah, at the moment if you look at what we've got and some of the stuff that you know the the lads have been showing you. It's all less a mess on GitHub. Um, there is a real need, and it's it's on our roadmap for this year to to make that. I mean, there's been a lot of exploratory work. You understand. So but now we've done some of that exploration. We know the things that work. Um, we need to put some of that back together so people don't have to go trawling through blog posts and GitHub and the like to get it. I mean, we already have packaging tools for deploying DHIS2. Um, is that Tito at the back? Yeah, T T Tito's new Ansible tools for deploying DHIS2. Everybody should use them. Um, if people are using those deployment tools, adding in little middleware containers and things that become a very easy thing to become part of a very standardized deployment. So yeah, if you use our standardized deployment tools, it's going to be much easier to get standardized file support pieces with it as well. Question. <laughs> Ranga. Yeah. I used to say Ranga. Okay. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm okay. Worried. I'm always worried because I don't know what you're going to ask. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just wondering. Okay. You, we spoke about this mapping that we've been doing this DHIS2 to, to file mapping. And uh, I'm just thinking of it in the context of profiles, because I heard somebody saying, and maybe it was you, that you can't use fire without a profile, perhaps. Yeah. Oh, but then you in can. this case... You can, but you shouldn't. Okay. In this case, if you do the mapping without a profile, 
is there any use of that besides what, what is there any benefit or is it just a repository? Um, is there I guess any, there are some things that is there constant. any benefit of using fire without profile? Oh, there is. Oh. Well, that's what people do it. People generally they are they are rational. Sometimes they don't appear rational, but they are being rational. Um, they do it because it's quicker. Um, and people are under a lot of pressure often. We want to see something working. Now you've been talking all this fire nonsense for too long now. We want to see something actually work. And then you'll get some developers who sit there and they go, and they'll make they'll make fire stuff. Um, and creating a profile is, I mean, it's an extra piece of work. The other thing is, it's also an extra piece of work by a different kind of person. Right? It's generally not developers who would be doing that. So if you don't have that, if you just give the problem to developers, instinctively they'll just go off and start writing code and not do a profile. Um, is there a benefit? Yes, it's quick to do. Um, I think the big, big downside of doing that is that, well, it gets everything going, but it, it doesn't really solve any of the problem of interoperability. Um, you've just got random fire stuff going backwards and forwards. You might as well just have used random XML, right? For, to really address interoperability, and particularly within a kind of HIE type of context where you've got more than two systems here, right? You've got maybe three, four systems. They all need to be able to understand the stuff. Uh, then you have to use fire. You have to use fire with a profile. Otherwise, it's just laziness. Right. To use then in that context, DHIS to itself, the programs that are in there are not profiled to some extent. So, is there any benefit in DHIS to for DHIS to? Ah, hmm. yeah, that's a very interesting question. There is, and and that's some. I I don't think Johan had much opportunity to discuss a little bit some of the issues in Rwanda that we were trying to address. I think part of the problem, I was in a presentation on Monday or Tuesday and something, but somebody was singing the praises of the DHIS2 infinitely flexible data model. Um, and the problem with the infinitely flexible data model is that you can make a whole lot of incomprehensible drivel with it. And that often happens, right? You've got programs that have been defined without using any kind of profiled thinking even. Right, and um, they end up not just incompatible with fire or incompatible with open MRS. They're even incompatible within with one another. Right, you can't you you can't make sense of two programs within the same database if they've all used a, a kind of ad hoc way of defining metadata. So one of the benefits we've seen of just making fire profiles is not even for doing data exchange using fire, but just the process of making a fire profile forces you to think about how your metadata is being created. It presents it in a nice way. And it give, we don't talk a lot about governance. It gives you something to govern, right? To say, now, now this is a profile. You are the stakeholders. If you want to make changes to it, you've got to figure out how you're going to do your change management. So currently, most DHIS2 implementations, there's there's very poor, if any, governance around, around metadata processes. It's kind of dawning realization. People think, know that they should do it, but they don't have good tools to do it. Now, fire profiles are actually quite a good tool to improve DHS to native metadata management. Are we, are we on time, off time? One minute coffee. Who wants to have the last word? I give somebody the last word, not me. Anne, the last word. Uh, Bear in mind that nobody, nobody will answer. You're just having the last no, word. No, no, I just have a comment, actually. And just they just put fire aside, going back to the smart guideline, the WHO work. And I think there will be a lot of those requests that are coming. And I would love to just let's work together and see you know, the lesson learned from doing the death with the HIV um, and the work with the power team and see how we can come up with a pattern 
Um, and what would be if there's any way of making it a shortcut so we do not have to go through such a painful process? It was a nearly three years process, everybody. And it's just really a lot of work. So two things. Number one is from WHO side, what can we sort of the way we we write the guidance or what can we you know contribute to make it easier? And also in terms of the process when we're mapping the indicators, um, what can be how we can improve the templates and any shortcut we can find would be fantastic. Um, but also, you know, what are the lessons learned here we can avoid and we can repeat? So these are something to follow up. But I think this has been a really long journey, but we are getting there. And thank you very much for the presentation and the work. Thanks.